morning, everyone. I invite you all to please join us and rise as we sing praises to our Lord this morning. Welcome to the Church of the Good Shepherd, um, UMC here in Bergenfield. My name is Donabelle, and I'm glad you are worshiping with us in person or online. This morning, we will be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion to which all persons are invited. If you are worshiping online and would like to participate, please gather bread and crackers and a beverage for that part of the service. Please remember that all our services can be found online and shared with a friend to worship at another time. Please join me in the call to worship. Powerful spirit, strong wind. Stirring us to life, breathing hope into despair. Warming spirit, dancing flame. Kindling joy and filling us with courage. Comforting spirit, gentle breeze. Refreshing our weariness, softening our grief. Wise spirit, blazing fire. Illuminating our path, casting out the darkness. Holy spirit, soaring dove. Calling us to worship, filling us with love. Our next song is found in uh, our Methodist hymnal, hymn, hymn number 77, verses 1, 2, and 4. Thank mm -hmm. you.
May I call on all the kids to come forward with Kuria and JD Armas. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So here I have, let me show everyone. If you, can, if you can't read this, it says happy birthday. And I would say it's pretty common sense that this is a birthday gift. Um, so here, you, as you can see, the children are holding balloons. Now, today we're having a party, OK? Can anybody guess what type of party we're having? Can you guess? Do you know? A birthday party? Yeah, good job. Give it up for Kate. <laughs> OK. So yeah, so we're having a birthday party today. Now, there might be someone here in the congregation or one of the kids whose birthday is coming up, but that is not the reason we're selling, celebrating a birthday party. Today is the day that we celebrate the birthday of the church. Did you guys know that the church has a birthday? Good job, Erickson, you know. Um, so yeah, the day that the church really got its start is the birthday of the church. We call it the day of Pentecost, and it's when we remember the day when God sent the Holy Spirit to his people, just as Jesus had promised that he would. Now, this gift um, that Jesus gave us is going to help us to remember what happened in the church on the day of Pentecost. It'll also remind us that the Holy Spirit is still at work in the church today. Now, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit gave the early church the gifts of forgiveness, truth, and gives us a better way to live. As we celebrate the birth of the church, let's remember that the Holy Spirit is still alive and at work in us today, like he was in the people of the early church. Now, let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit, and we ask that you help us to remember that the Holy Spirit still fills the church with power today, just as he did on the day of Pentecost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may go back, kids. Before I read the scripture, I would like to welcome back Pastor Elaine. Please stand for the reading of our scripture found in Joshua chapter 4, verses 9 to 24. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan River and camped at Gilgal at the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan so that you could safely cross. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always revere the Lord your God. This is God's word for us. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. of time. <laughs> of course, it doesn't help that my watch got put into a moving box and I haven't yet found it. Hello, everybody. Gosh, it's good to be back with you. It is good. So this morning, we have an opportunity to 
really take a look at the question, what do these stones mean? Now, if we lived in Stonehenge, England, we might be answering that question if a tourist came to us and said, what's with those rocks over there that I've traveled halfway around the world to see? Stonehenge is the best known prehistoric monument in Europe. Given our proximity here in Bergenfield to Dumont and Creskill, you and I are more likely, however, to be asked about the monument that's at the circle on Madison and Knickerbocker Road. Do you know that which one I'm talking about? It's a 66 foot tall monument modeled after the Washington Monument, which marks the center of Camp Merritt, through which more than a million soldiers passed as they went to or from the war, First World War, 1917 and 1919. The 12 stones that God commanded to be pulled from the Jordan River are, in a sense, a monument. They speak to the relationship between our creator and our ancestors. Like a relationship uh, such as a marriage, there are good times. There are times of joy and there are times of sorrow. There are times of uh, sickness and there are times of health. There are times and there are times of poverty. Shall I use this mic, Alan? Because this one keeps going in and out. Okay. Let me turn this. However we look at it, the stones speak to God's covenant relationship with us, God's faithfulness and love, and our love back to God. So when you think about it, Church of the Good Shepherd is also a monument to God. And so we might ask ourselves the question, what does this church building, thinking of it as a stone, mean? What has taken place in this building and on this property that will speak to generations to come, just as those 12 stones spoke to the Israelites when the children asked their parents, mommy and daddy, what is this stone here for? And they told them about a God that took the Israelites through the river as they escaped from Egypt or across the River Jordan, pulling back the water so that they could make their way through. The God of the burning bush, the God who sent Noah uh, out on an ark for a float and then brought him back to safety with all the animals and his family. A God who has stayed with us. Does the story of Church of the Good Shepherd give us strength and courage when we as a congregation might feel weak or weary or that the task ahead of us is just too big? Can we look back to this meaning of our church stones and find strength and confidence? I spent a fair amount of time this week reading every book that I could find <laughs> about the history of this church, and what a joy that was. And I received some emails from a few of you, and what you've shared with me will be uh, brought into this sermon and to next week's. The story of our church stones begins in 1949, when the New Jersey Council of Churches decided that the area where CGS sits needed a Protestant church. There wasn't a, a Protestant church within a mile of this point. So the lot upon which our church sits and the parking lot across the street were acquired by the Jersey City District Missionary Society. A young Methodist pastor named Robert Burbank was assigned to organize and establish a new church in a new community. On World Communion Sunday, which is the first Sunday in October, they began what Burbank called a grand adventure. The first choice for the church's name was Chapel on the Hill. This used to be a patch of weeds, I'm told, up elevated on a hill because of the slant of New Bridge Road and Prospect, particularly at the time. But the investors in this church said, no way. We're not going to be a chapel. We're going to be a full-sized church. So they looked at their list of 28 names, and they said the second one is the best, Church of the Good Shepherd. Within the next 10 years, the wisdom of their decision was evident. 
CGS had members from 22 different denominations and religions, all who converted to Methodism. Burbank wrote, for two years, we were a traveling church, using the gym at nearby Lincoln School while we raised funds to build our church and waited for the building to be completed. Each Sunday, we carried everything necessary for worship and church school from our homes so that we might worship and study together. A painting of Jesus Christ was hung over a gym window, and that became our altar, and we brought everything else that we needed. Our church school grew so rapidly that we ran out of resources, teaching materials before the end of every quarter when they reordered. The church newsletter was created in the home of a church member and sent to the congregation and 300 area churches who were supporting the growth of this fledgling congregation. When the church construction was completed, church members painted the interior walls and ceilings as well as stained the sanctuary ceiling. When the congregation held the first complete service in the latter part of 1951, the cost of the building project was roughly $61,000. You might remember that when I came two years ago, I said something about the relationship between Calvary and CGS. Well, the relationship was clarified as I read this week. It turns out that people from Calvary and Dumont, which had started around the same time had a number of folks that were in the building trades and in the financial arena. So they helped this church get started in those very early stages. And when Calvary held its opening services, because of that helping relationship, the pastor of CGS came and spoke at one of the opening services at Calvary. So we are bound together by our history in that manner. Ten years into this church, an addition to the building was planned. They extended the social hall and the facilities at the sanctuary level to accommodate the growth in the church school. The church school began with 20 kids in October 1949, and it had increased to 103 just eight months later. Phil Sternenberg was here as a preschooler, so he would have remembered those early, early days. Nancy, you've been here for a long time. Yeah, yeah. As I read through the memorial book, I was very impressed by how nearly everything in this church was given by sacrificial givers of those early years. All of the stained glass windows, the piano, the organ, the communion elements. The sundial out there is a memorial to a person, and we need to polish it up in honor of that individual. Everything, the Bibles, the film strip projectors that were used during those times, that early AV technology, all of those things given by individuals and by the Women's Church Society and the men's group and everybody who came together who did fundraisers to be able to purchase what was needed. The large cross over our exterior wall facing South Prospect, that cross that when it's illuminated, particularly at night, draws us all into the power of Jesus Christ and the reminder of his love for us, that cross was given by more than 50 families who gave sacrificially. The stone representing the six-year appointment of Reverend Frank Ostertag speaks to how God's people were dealing with social issues prevalent in the 1960s. Ostertag wrote, the integration, racism, issue and fair housing concerns were energetically discussed at our administrative meetings. Meaning, back then even, the people of this congregation found themselves sometimes at loggerheads, sometimes having diverse opinions, and that's just the way the church family rolls. We are all people who are one body and one spirit, but sometimes not of the same opinion. 
This, I think, is a good reminder that the church is to be part of the world and to bring justice to the oppressed. In the mid-60s, Reverend Malon Smith wrote about several characteristics which I also noticed when I first came here. The deep sense of importance placed on worship. The excellence of the Christian education program. In my time, because of COVID, this means the time with our children. NJ, good job this morning. Second or third, the dedication among the women and the men who worked so faithfully to maintain the church. Long ago, there was a group of men who met every week, right? And I remember um, knowing some of them. The Scoutiers uh, were one of those families, John and his friends. And they would get together, I think, every Saturday and have coffee and donuts and then they would, this is what he told me, and then they would do whatever tasks needed to be done. But the men of this church, as they continue to do now, took care of God's temple in a way that was simply amazing. Not to say the women didn't as well. In those three years, writes Reverend Malone, it was a difficult period of transition for CGS. It was like a roller coaster because the church had rapid growth when they opened up and people were all excited about the Methodist church in their community, just blocks away from your home, right? Close by for Phil as well. And at the same time that they had just this high of rapid growth, there was a worldwide denominational downward trend of church attendance and membership across all denominations. So life in a church has always these ups and these downs and this cyclical pattern. The stone that uh, comes after Reverend Malone is one that um, is really interesting to me because it, it shows the formation of some very important groups and activities and factors within this church. In 1968, Reverend Bipps and his wife Alma came to CGS. The church was in its 17th year, and the pastor said that he noticed apathy in several areas. First, there was very low participation in denominational giving, enabling God's mission to reach across the globe. In other words, we gave for the local church, but we did not give to our apportionment as part of the United Methodist Church for the, God's love to reach across the world. Second, Bips wrote, there were empty pews and chairs in the church school and in the sanctuary. Third and fourth were the bleak finances and the apathy among the members who felt they didn't need to serve God through the church. So if you ever feel like, gee, just a small percentage of people are helping, that's happened before. There are highs and lows and, again, cycles in the church. But the good news is that Reverend Bipps did not give up. He rallied the church leaders, and they faced the situation with a new spirit, a holy spirit, a spirit of power. They called upon the Holy Spirit to rain down upon them, just like the disciples at that first Pentecost. A group of clergy and lady from CGS, Clinton Avenue Reformed Church, and South Presbyterian Church got together. They formed a group called ECUM. Do you remember this? E-C-U-M, right. And they created a collective ministry to serve the entire area. CGS's church house, and I'm assuming what we call the little house, was dedicated as a residence for a youth pastor. He was hired to address the needs of youth in the Bergenfield area, not just CGS. The new minister and his wife, it said, began walking the streets of the borough, meeting youth who felt alienated for various reasons. With the cooperation of the Bergenfield borough and the public school, they were able to have the cafeteria and the auto shop at the high school opened up on weeknights. Hundreds of youth participated in the programs that they led, and youth centers were established in many of the churches in our area. One center catered to junior high youth, and they had an average weekly attendance of 200 youth every week. 
a drug counseling center, a committee to build housing for senior citizens, a program of neighbor helping neighbor, along with a regional singles ministry were all created by this collective group. Shows us that when we work together for God, we can do great things. Reverend Bipps wrote, we the people of CGS move into the future after 25 years of service to God and all humans with a new sense of dedication. I want you to remember that period of time. It was difficult, but they came together. They found new ways to be the church for the community. It was Mrs. Bipps, Alma, who was integral in the start of the Good Shepherd Preschool. This preschool became a vital part of CGS's ministry with hundreds of children passing through the classrooms under the loving guidance of skilled teachers for more than 30 years. The music ministry at CGS, and this is where Nancy Rounds remembers a lot of family activities, flourished during the same period of time. Now your dad came and helped substitute on the organ for every now and then. He would play the organ if he was needed, if the organist couldn't make it. And you remember all the different choirs. Oh my goodness, as I thumbed through the books, there was a children's choir, a junior choir, a, a women's choir. And um, not only did they sing during worship, but they put on shows. I mean, this became a very big deal. And the, the, the books and the, the history of this church talks about all the different shows that were put on and the type of fellowship. So the history of CGS is so strongly steeped in times of fellowship. What we do after our worship or when we get together at other times is what your ancestors, your predecessors in this church have done for decades. And it has been a strength of this church. In the 1980s, CGS adopted this logo, we are a community of faith as its statement of purpose. Community outreach became a priority as evidenced by sponsoring children overseas, collecting clothes and gifts. The establishment of a drop-in center for seniors participating in the crop walk food collections for Mission Bergenfield and Thanksgiving in-gathering, vacation Bible schools, Christmas caroling, and helping with an overflow shelter for homeless programs. These are all examples of how CGS has, since the beginning, been active in serving God by loving other people. In the 1990s, pastors Jerry Round and Clark Callender both noted the sense of community among the people of CGS. And I love this. Reverend Callender wrote, and I quote, our laughter at meetings in worship and fellowship meant that we enjoyed spending time with our Savior. We enjoy, in all caps, God. And in enjoying God and glorifying God, we are called to a deeper service and witness. Boy, doesn't that speak to you guys right now. In 1997, CGS opened its doors to Harvest Ministries, sharing facilities and Christian fellowship with this very small but vital Asian American congregation led by the Reverend Alec Park. As we entered the most recent decades of CGS, our challenges centered in several areas. There was a division, a very sharp and strong division among the congregation over the removal of a pastor in 2004, 2005. It took the skilled work and healing prayers by many to move CGS through this period of tribulation. Interim Pastor Jerry Koob wrote in his pastor's report, I believe God has gathered a culturally diverse group of human beings who desire to grow in their faith, are responsive to preaching that nurtures their spiritual growth, and who have a new spirit of collaboration leading to healing. I included this period in CGS's history because we need to remember that some of our stones recount difficulties. They recount painful times. The monument up at the circle, part of that monument is for all of those soldiers, the one million that I told you about, 
But then there's more than 500 people who died of an outbreak of, I believe it was influenza, in the early years in this area. Some of our stones are painful. And it's important that we remember that our shared life has periods of loss, it has periods of disappointment, it has periods where uh, key members have passed on to life eternal or moved to a new area, it has times where there's social turbulence in the world around us over which we may not have control that comes into the life of the church because Jesus called to be Christians who are involved in the world. The church is a sanctuary in one respect, but it is also a building that in a sense is permeable and was always designed to be that way. The world within and the world out, it is all part of God's parish. We're not to come in and then put blinders on when we go out. We're to go out into the world and to free the oppressed to help give sight to the blind and to love those that need to be loved. In the years between 2005 and 2022, we have faced many challenges. The reports from pastors prior to my appointment two years ago show significant efforts to follow the will of God. Pastors Robin Mitchell, Jun Yoshimatsu, Zhonglin Li, all guided you back to a path that included Bible studies, spiritual retreats, church out in the nature. I read about an overnight camping time where you went up to, I think, uh, New York State, camped, and, and it said it was very cold at night in our, in our pop-up tents, but we all in the morning talked about doing this again the next year because we had so much fun. There were activities um, in the church school and youth ministries, and the music ministry, again, flourished. There were community ministries. The Seven Up is one that I know you all think about. The road has been bumpy and winding, and the pandemic did not help, <laughs> but the presence of the Holy Spirit is with us. I saw your commitment shine through the bleak days of the pandemic. I can close my eyes and remember standing outside in the parking lot of Calvary when many of you would drive up to fill your cars with boxes of food and gallons of milk that you were distributing. These are the early days when I was just getting to know Aldridge and Alma and Miriam and Noemi and you would come up and I'm thinking, who is it, who is it, who is it, who is it, what's her name, what's her name, what's her name? <laughs> and you would load up your cars and then you would go and share those expressions of God's compassion with co-workers or people in your apartment complex or other persons or yourselves knowing that God will always come through and that we have an opportunity to share God's love. As we come out of the pandemic, you will be under the guidance of a new pastor, Michelle. She is a wonderful person. She is a strong leader. She has a deep faith in Christ. Many of you know her from Ridgefield Park, UMC. You are in good hands. And it will please me to no end to watch from the sidelines to see how you continue to grow in your vitality. I hope this has been helpful to you. It's a different kind of sermon, but I felt it was important for us to recognize the cloud of witnesses that are all around us, that are cheering us on, that we stand on the history and the shoulders of people who have faced similar challenges as us, who have found unique ways to be the new church, the church of Jesus Christ in a very active way. And I pray that you will continue to do that, knowing that you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit who will not allow anything to separate you from the love of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so now we move into the sacrament of Holy Communion. I think that we have um, a song, One Bread, One Body. Oh, we have our slides. Oh, wait, take a seat, sorry. 
I'm not really on my game this morning. I discovered that over at Calvary. <laughs> it just is what it is. So Carissa put together these slides to give you a visual um, view of the history. I'm so sorry I didn't call that forth. Take a look. Your picnics, VBSs. Not sure what that was. One of the things that came up in the reports was the communion breakfast. So many of the pastors mentioned that. That must have been a really special time. I read that the community, people in the public around the church, would call up and ask for, you know, when can we reserve or get our tickets? But that was a very special time. You have such a rich history. <laughs> you tell Mr. Ron. Carissa, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Pictures are worth a thousand words, to be sure. Okay, so we invite you to come to the Lord's table. Donna Bell, will you assist me? Yes, no, there we go. There we go. We're going to skip the song One Bread, One Body. Go ahead. The Spirit of our living God be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. He proclaimed freedom for the bound, justice for the oppressed, grace for the lost, love for the prodigal. Through the life and ministry of Jesus, we can imagine and live into a community where all are invited into greater compassion. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for the many for forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us sustenance for our days, love for the simple and ordinary life, fuel for justice in this world. By your Spirit, open us to each other. Open us to the world, making us one in you through Christ, in the power of your amazing grace. As always, I want to remind you that Christ was broken so that you and I can be restored to wholeness. And that this is not the pastor's table or the table of CGS. This is the Lord's table. And all are invited to receive these simple communion elements to remember his gift of his life and his love for us. And so now we invite you to um, come forward if you have not received the cup to take the bread, dip it into the chalice of juice. And if you'd like to kneel at the altar rail for a time of individual prayer before you return to your, your pew.
and switch sides. Body of Christ. Let us pray. Loving God, we don't always understand how this little bit of bread and juice connect us so fully with you. What we do understand is your love for us and your design to give us so something so simple and so available to remind us of your great love. But whenever we have the bread or the juice, help us to remember your sacrifice. Help us to remember your great forgiveness, and grace, and mercies. And help us to remember that we are, as God's people, one body throughout the world. to express your thankfulness and trust in God by giving to the Lord, Lord's work today. The ways for you to give financially are noted on the screen. Our prayer of thanksgiving. 
Lord's word cannot express the gratitude we feel for your endless love and call upon our lives. May our financial gifts, our time, talent, and prayers extend your reach to those in need of your grace. Set loose your spirit within us and be the wind at our backs so we might participate with you in the renewing of lives and song of peace. In the powerful name of Jesus the Christ we pray, amen. May I call on the, uh, the worship team for our next song, You Are My All in All. us so clearly that when we do fall down, and we do, you will pick us up. That when we tend to heap on the shame or the guilt that you say enough, let it go. You are made in my image. I forgive you. Start again. In my grace, begin again, knowing that you are my beloved child, in whom I am well pleased. Oh, Lord God, over the decades at this church, so many people have come to know you through song. Their voices raised in praise, the lyrics of the songs that taught us so much about your love, about who you are, a God who provides us in the times when there is need. A God whose timing is different than ours and teaches us to be patient and to be humble and to trust in you. 
a God who created all that lives and breathes and continues to watch over this amazing planet and begs us to do the same. Lord God, you are our all in all. Families throughout the years here at this church have learned about you from the stories that have been told from the Bible, a God of justice and mercy, a God who gave his son, being born in humble beginnings, a God who suffered all that we tend to encounter, who was betrayed, who wasn't understood, and yet continued to move forth, knowing that you would provide him with the strength that he needed to bring your temple back to being a place of worship, to bring your people back to being a community where no one was left at the outside, at the outskirts, that all were found to be worthy in your sight. And even as the disciples and we through the years, the generations, have wondered at times and failed to reach that high bar of love that you have shown us, you continue, Lord, to work within us. You bring babies into our midst. You've begun marriages and relationships that are strong, that show us what it is about to be in a trusting, healthy, respectful relationship. You give us wings and prayers to begin in new places. You will be with Emmanuel when he goes out to Texas. You will be with all of us as we move forward graduating from one school year or moving from one situation into the next. Lord God, you are our all in all. Help us to trust that. Help us to always know your heart of love for us and to be open to receiving your love so that our cup overflows and that we can't help but share that love with others. That joy and that peace that comes from knowing there is one bigger than all of us, bigger than all of the evil and the violence in the world, that you right now are in Ukraine. You are with those that are grieving, those that are scared, those that are in shelter. You're with the responders, the families that have opened their hearts and their doors not only in Ukraine, but in other countries, to take in refugees, to do what is needed. You're with the families whose children were lost. You're with the police in Yelvaiti, Texas, that are dealing with the second guessing and why didn't we do this and all of those difficult questions. You're with the people in Florida as hurricane season begins and a new storm comes their way. Lord, you were with us wherever we are. You're with Tony and Miriam, healing him, strengthening his body. You're in the Philippines. You're with Precious, with Debbie, with others. You were with our loved ones and with us and you know our needs before we can even put them to words. Help us to just open ourselves to you, to surrender our tendency to control, to plot, to plan, and allow us to just be willing to go with the flow of your love and the power of your Holy Spirit that is always among us and within us. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. Hear us now, Lord, as we join our voices together in that prayer which Jesus taught long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, go into the world knowing that you are not alone. Go into the world knowing that God has uniquely blessed you. 
go into the world knowing that God has some expectations of all of us to share our gifts, to be open to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Go into the world in joy and peace. In the name of God, in the name of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. If everyone can arise for our last song, let's put our hands together. I lay my life, I lay my life down at your feet, cause you're the only one I need. I turn to you and you are always there. In trouble times, it's you I see. I put you first, that's all I need. I humble all I am, all to you. Come on, sing it one way. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. about the music ministry of this church was that Nellie, and I forget her last name, but when Nellie was the music director early on, if she heard a good voice in the pews one Sunday, by the next Sunday, you were up here in the choir. <laughs> this woman was a force to be contended with. So I heard lots of good voices out there, so I'm wondering if next Sunday it's gonna flip. We'll have fewer people in the pews and more people up here. Go in peace, everyone. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>